So we've generated artificial spike train data through this model, this coin flipping model. And we can analyze these coin flip data that we've just produced in the same way we've analyzed real spike train data. So for example, we have this statistical model where we flip a coin in each sub interval. Every once in a while we observe an H with this biased coin. And we can convert this into a spike train representation where every time we observe an H, we indicate that sub-interval with a tick mark. Now we can perform an analysis on this spike train data we've just generated through flipping a biased coin and count up the number of spikes in the trial. And in this case, we observe three spikes. So we can analyze the spike train data in the exact same way we've analyzed the real data generated by a neuron. And perhaps we can imagine repeating this procedure many times. And we can ask questions like, what total numbers of spikes do we expect in, uh, when we observe these coin flip data? So here we've generated a single sequence of coin flips, and we found three spikes. If we were to repeat this procedure over and over again and keep flipping our coins and generating these data, how many spikes would we expect to see? Would it always be three? Would we have some variability around three? Would we sometimes see one, sometimes see ten? So we'd like to answer this question, how many spikes do we expect to observe when we generate these coin flip data? So equivalently to that question, how many spikes do we expect to observe, we can ask this question, how many H's do we expect? Because remember, each H indicates a spike in our statistical model. So here again, we have our time axis divided up into lots of tiny sub-intervals. And remember, we have M coin flips. So we have uh, a coin flip in each of these sub-intervals, and we have M total sub-intervals. And we know the probability of a spike, or flipping our coin and observing H, uh, in each sub-interval. So we know the probability of flipping our coin and observing H. And let's define some symbols for these probabilities. Let's call P of H. P of H, the probability of heads. Flipping our coin and then observing H, which we interpret as representing a spike. So this little P for probability and then of observing H, heads. So the probability of observing a spike or observing H. And in the same way, we'll define P uh, as a function of T, P of T is the probability of tails, or not observing a spike. So then the expected number of spikes. So how many spikes do we expect when we perform M coin flips? Well, what will that be? It'll be the number of flips that we perform times the probability of observing H, the probability of a spike. That'll give us the expected number of spikes. So in this case, we have M coin flips, and we have the probability, P of H, of observing H on each flip. And that should give us the expected number of spikes. Okay, so that may seem a little abstract, but let's consider a concrete example. So here's a concrete example of this expected number of spikes. So let's imagine we have a thousand sub-intervals. And the probability of a spike, or the probability of flipping our coin and observing H, is 0.5. So this is a fair coin where perhaps we have the most intuition. Imagine taking a quarter out of your pocket and flipping it a thousand times, and that's going to represent our spike train data in this case, a fair coin. So what is the expected number of spikes? If we flip a, pair, a fair coin a thousand times, how many times do we expect to observe H? Well, we can compute this quantity by uh, evaluating the following expression, the number of flips times the probability of H in each flip. So in this case, we flip our coin a thousand times, and we know the probability of H in this fair coin flip is 0.5. So the expected number of spikes, or the expected number of H's that we observe, is equal to 500. Uh, so to summarize this, we flip a fair coin a thousand times, and we expect to observe H, or get a spike in uh, half the time. And hopefully this makes some intuitive sense. We're flipping a fair coin, and a reasonable guess for the expected number of uh, spikes we'll get, or H's uh, we will get, is 500. Okay, so let's consider a small sample, or a small example of this statistical modeling in detail. And by small, I mean that we'll consider here four sub-intervals. So we're going to flip our coin only four times. We'll set M equal to four. And we're also going to assume a biased coin, where the probability of H probability of heads is 0.1, so again, that's for a spike, while well, the probability of tails is necessarily 0.9, no spike. Why must it be 0.9? Well, we must have the sum of these two probabilities equal to 1. The probability of heads plus the probability of tails better equal 1, because when we flip our coin, we're going to observe either heads or tails, so we have to, we have to account for uh, uh, all of the things we could possibly see, H or T, 
we're going to observe with probability 1 either h or t. So we've got to make sure these probabilities sum to 1. And what's nice about this small example of four subintervals is that we can list the outcomes of our four coin flips. So here's an illustration of our very simple example here. We have four subintervals following our stimulus. And we can list the outcome, all possible outcomes, for these four coin flips. And so let's do that here. We're going to write the flip number 1, 2, 3, 4 and list all possible scenarios. So perhaps we flip our coin four times and we observe H on each flip. So that's one possible outcome. Another possible outcome uh, is the following, where we flip our coin four times. And in this case, notice in this second scenario, we observe H three times and T once. And if you look at this, perhaps you can observe the symmetry. Notice we've just moved that T around from the first flip, second flip, third flip, fourth flip. And we can interpret these results. Remember, we've said H represents a spike. So in this uh, first scenario of coin flips, we get a spike on each flip of four total spikes. If we think about this second scenario, how many total spikes are there? Well, it corresponds to three, because we observe three H's uh, over the four flips. We can continue this procedure. Let's consider a third scenario here where we observe two H's. And we can move these two H's around this list. And we get another sequence or other possible sequences of spikes that we may observe, where in this case we observe two total spikes in this third column. Let's keep doing this. What if we observe only one spike in our four flips, where we move this H around from the four possible flip positions? Maybe we get an H on the first flip and then no more. Maybe we get an H on only the second flip, only the third flip, only the fourth flip. And then finally, we could flip our biased coin four times, and maybe we don't observe any H's, so we have no spikes in this last one. So zero total spikes in this last sequence of flips. We can count up the number of possible outcomes we can observe. So if we count up the number of possible outcomes, we have one outcome with four total spikes. We have four outcomes with three spikes. We have one, two, three, four, five, six outcomes with two spikes, four outcomes with one spike, and one outcome with no spikes. If we add up all of those outcomes, there are 16 possible outcomes. So if we count up all these, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So we can add up all of the sequences that we have here. There are 16 possible outcomes. And we can list all these outcomes because the number of subintervals is small. We're only considering four subintervals. We'll look at more as we go along. OK. And now we can ask questions about these flips. Like, what is the probability of observing four H's or getting four spikes in our four coin flips? Now, in four coin flips, there's only one possible way to get four H's. We must get an H on each flip. We only have four flips, so we're going to get four uh, spikes or four H's. So we have to get a spike on each flip. And we can now uh, compute quantities. So we know the probability of H on the first flip. And we define that as P of H, the probability of H on a single flip. And we said that's 0.1. What is the probability of H on the second coin flip? Well, it's the same because all these flips are independent. We flip our bias coin. The probability of heads is still 0.1. What about the probability of H on the third flip? It's the same. 0.1 in the fourth flip, it's the same. So we know the probability of flipping our coin and observing H on each flip. It's always 0.1. Now because these flips are independent, each flip has, the result of any flip has no dependence on any other coin flip, the probability of observing these four spikes is the product of the probabilities of each individual flip. So what does that mean? So the probability uh, the total probability of observing H four times, how do we compute it? Well, we multiply the probability of H on the first flip, 0.1, times the probability of H on the second flip, times 0.1, times the probability of H on the third flip, so again, by multiplying by 0.1, times the probability of H on the fourth flip, again, multiplying by 0.1, we get this really tiny value, 0 0.0001. Right, this really tiny value. And we conclude in this case is that it's very unlikely to observe four spikes and four coin flips. And hopefully that's intuitive. The probability of, of flipping a coin and observing H is small. It's only 0.1. And the probability of performing that uh, four times in a row, so flipping our coin four times in a row and observing H each time is really small. So each value is unlikely. So the probability of uh, repeating this process and getting H four times in a row, very unlikely. And that's what we find when we compute the probability of observing four H's or four spikes in four flips with this biased coin.